press start, how late are we? How late will we go? I have, I have a call at the at the top of the next hour. Welcome, y'all. It's my favorite podcaster, Donna D, and the Urban Mommy Podcast. Make sure y'all subscribe and share. Tell a friend and hit that bell to keep up with the latest updates. Cause you don't want to miss what my girl got to say. I'm just saying. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. This is your girl, Donna D, a.k.a. The Urban Mommy, and I am back with another podcast. Today, I am joined by Billy, and we are going to be talking about uh, mindful midlife crisis, mindfulness, burnout, and all of that good stuff that we love to talk about. Remember, we are here to work through our everything together. So this is this is like our therapy. We're doing therapy together. So welcome, Billy. Thank you for having me, Donna. It's a pleasure. Same here. Okay, so can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Billy Lahr. I'm a mindfulness and intentional living coach. I'm currently in Seoul, South Korea. This is my happy place. So I like being here in the fall and in the spring because that's when the weather is the nicest. And then I'm originally from Minnesota and I worked in education for 21 years. I was an English teacher for 15 years. And then I was a dean of students for six years. And when you're the dean of students, you're never the you're never the good guy. You're right. always the bad guy. So my job was to constantly deliver bad news to students, to teachers, to parents. And that just really burned me out. That's not the kind of job that I wanted to have. I, I missed. I like being in front of a group of people. I actually feel more comfortable in a group of 100 than I do one. So that, you know, the extrovert in me kind of likes that, that performance. And that's something of what teaching is. It's, it's a performance, but in doing so, you are trying to help people navigate whatever complexities and possibilities are going on in their life. And I was doing that through literature as an English teacher. So trying to help students learn about themselves through literature while also, you know, obviously teaching them grammar, those kinds of things. And as I was experiencing this burnout, I, I I decided to take a leave from education and I started traveling and I traveled around for a year. I realized there wasn't going to be a way for me to transition back into that dean position. So I just continued on traveling. I went back to the States. I sold all my stuff and I've been traveling since then. And it's really been a, a great experience and it's taught me a lot about the principles that I bring into my coaching program, which is essentially, you know, it's I'm I'm very anti follow your passions. I think that that is complete and utter nonsense. I think okay. passions is a is a byproduct of the the our recognition of our strengths, of an exploration of our curiosities, and connecting with our crew, our our people, our community, and and then that leads us to purpose. And then the way that we turn purpose into passion is by commit or by multiplying that by two. Let me try that again. Taking our purpose, multiplying it by consistency, discipline, patience, and self-compassion. And in doing that, then we reach our passion. So that's kind of what I've been, that's what I've been coaching people. And in turn, I do that through mindfulness. And if people are unfamiliar with mindfulness, mindfulness is Sitting with what is present and being non judgmental about it. And it sounds really easy, but the mind wants to wander. It wants to take us to the past. It wants to take us to the future. It wants to create a narrative. It wants to tell a story. And those are all normal things. That's just what the mind does. So then, how do we train the brain in order to simply be, to go from doing mode? to being mode. And that's really, really difficult. And the research says that we need to do things like that. We need to cool our brain because as we practice mindfulness, what we're doing is we are building up the gray matter in our prefrontal cortex, which is the area that regulates emotion. And it's actually cooling our amygdala, which is our fight, flight, or fright part of our brain. So those are... 
you know, those are the principles that that I've been working with. And it's all come from my own personal experiences with being intentional and being mindful in my life. Okay. So you answer like all of my questions without <laughs> What are your follow up? What do you want to know about all that stuff? <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you took away all my questions. So, but I'm going to ask you to, to go back a little because my, yeah. my first question, I wanted to kind of expound on it a little. My first question was explain a little bit more like why you say you don't like the follow your passion thing, but it still comes back to passion. So what is it about follow your passion that you don't particularly like? Yeah. So I don't think we should start with passion because when we do, we, it just leads to burnout because we get very, very excited about, oh, I love this. I love this. I love this. And I think it gets conflated with being excited or, or having a hobby. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to turn something into a passion, then we have to stop and look at, okay, you know, A, am I good at this? If I'm not good at this, am I curious about it? And if I am curious about it, am I willing to put in the time and energy and discipline it's going to take to turn this into something that that I feel passionate about? Not only that, but am I willing to be patient and self-compassion with myself as I'm going through this learning process? I mean, you and I are indie podcasters, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So we... At this point now, for us, it's become a passion because we're consistently putting out episodes. We are, are disciplined enough to create a structure that allows us to consistently put those episodes out. We have to be patient. Mm -hmm. We had to. We have to learn that you know the technology of this because. Not, I wasn't tech savvy, and I'm I wouldn't still won't call myself tech savvy, but I'm more tech savvy. I had to create systems, and then the self compassionate piece is just like, like I wish my podcast was growing faster than what it is, right? So, so I'm patient with how it's growing, but then I'm also able to look at myself and be like, hey man, you're doing what you can. And you're you're doing with what you what you have for resources. So give yourself a little bit of grace as you navigate this, as you figure this out, as you continue to build on this passion. And I think that's really, really crucial. I, I think people it doesn't take long for people to figure out their purpose. I really don't think that. That's people know what they're good at. And if they don't know what they're good at, just ask someone sitting next to you, someone who works with you. Hey, what, what are my strengths? What do you see as my strengths? I think where we struggle is seeing those strengths and accepting that these are our strengths, especially if we are, you know, we're lacking confidence or we're, we're just feeling low or if we're stuck and we've been doing kind of the same thing over and over and over again. And we want to shift our what we're doing, but we are just we're we're in tunnel vision and we don't see where our strengths are. We don't see where our transferable skills and strengths lie. So for me, that's that's what I do as a coach. Nothing of what I talk about as a coach is new or revolutionary. The reality is that you you already know all the things you need to do to be successful. The challenge comes from the consistency and the discipline. And it also comes from, you know what you need to do, but you've pushed it to the back of your mind because you have so much going on that it's hard for those good habits that you know you, you quote unquote should be doing that would benefit you. It's hard for you to bring those to the forefront because you're not being present. You're in constant doing mode and you're not in being mode. And a lot of times a being mode, things just sort of come to the front and you're like, oh yeah, okay. And then you just sort of sit with that and you accept where you are. And then you say to yourself, 
is this can i use this for moving forward how can i use this for moving forward and so then that becomes the challenge is like uh not, because the excuse is i don't have time i don't have time i don't have time well me i'm able to sit you down and say let's just do a time inventory and let's take a look at where you actually do have time and then let's create a structure let's create a routine that maximizes your time maybe not necessarily maximizes your time but makes you a bit more efficient we don't need to maximize everything so but we can be more efficient in what we're doing and in being more productive we don't need to optimize we don't need to maximize but we can just be a little bit more productive a little bit more efficient in that time and i'm coming from an education background where bells told me to start and stop things so i had to be efficient in what i was doing i couldn't cram too much in a lesson because if i did then you know I, I, then i would miss out on on information or students would miss out on information or i would rush through information so i could get through everything and more isn't necessarily better so how do we take a look at what we all have going on or what we are all doing and make that system more efficient for us to be productive okay so i know you said that while you were traveling for two years you were able to i guess find your purpose how did traveling help you to find it yeah i would say that my i've always known that my purpose is is helping people in some way helping people with their identity helping people navigate challenges and i feel very very fortunate that i figured that out at a young age and so that's what led me to go into into education <laughs> interestingly enough and i think a lot of people well i don't know a lot of people but i think some people make this mistake when i was in high school and when i started college i was originally going for computer programming and about two weeks into computer programming, I realized that if I continue down this route, I am going to fail out of college because I don't know anything about computer programming. I went into it because I liked typing on the computer. I liked chat rooms. I liked writing stories on the computer. And my brother-in-law worked for Microsoft. And I'm like, oh, well, he makes good money. So that to me all said, oh, well, I could probably be a computer programmer. And then when I got into the computer programming classes, I'm like, oh, I'm dumb as hell. Like, there, I don't, I don't know any of this stuff. So when I went home one time to visit my high school baseball coach, he was, a, he's a health teacher, and I went into the classroom, we're just hanging out, and he said, hey, do you want to teach class today? I was like, yeah. What do you, what, what's the topic? And he said we're talking about the top ten leading causes of death. I'm like, oh, I remember that conversation. I remember that discussion a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'll lead that. And I got up there and it just felt so natural. And I said to him, oh, I, I, that was a lot of fun. He's like, you ever thought about being a teacher? I'm like, I am now. And my favorite subject in high school was English. So it just made sense for me to figure out that, oh, this is my purpose. This is, this is, these are my strengths. Why am I swimming upstream in computer programming? So I lucked out. I figured that out very early. I figured that out in college. Um, so then when I transitioned though out of education, I still want to, there's still this desire to have conversations with people, to connect with people, but also help them figure out their challenges so that they can live a life that that they can look back on and be like oh this was fulfilling i feel good that i navigated this situation and i have been practicing mindfulness for 10 years i started practicing mindfulness because i was struggling with my own mental health um i i mean you could you could hear how intense i am and it's, that a lot of that is comes from anxiety and i'm high energy so people are like you know, this guy, this guy is a meditation teacher. <laughs> he sounds like a spaz. And I tell people that I practice meditation so that I can be at this level of obnoxious, because if I didn't, I'd be an out of control a-hole. So that's, that's kind of where, how I came to meditations is because I have this anxiety. I have this high intensity 
And I was constantly running in the red and I wanted to be able to at least be in the yellow or the orange more often. And so I thought to myself, all right, I'm no longer in education. I still want to help people. What is it? What is it that I have to offer? What is it that I know? Where's my knowledge base? And my knowledge base is in mindfulness. And oh, I think one of the nicest compliments anyone's ever given me is, you know, Billy, when you're excited about something, you want everyone else to be excited about it too. <laughs> and I knew how beneficial mindfulness was in transforming my life. I often say that mindfulness not only changed my life, but it most likely saved it as well. And I imagine that there are people out there who are as high strung as I am, who would benefit from having a practice that allows them to see stimuli and respond as opposed to react mm. to it. And for me, I really had to work on impulsive behaviors. I had to work on emotionally reacting to things and in turn hitting the, the slow-mo button and processing through, okay, 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 this is what's going on here. And where is this person's perspective? Where are they coming from? Am, am I taking this personally? What is it that this person is saying that is bothering me or is it triggering me in some way? And then being able to respond to that. And that has taken a lot of work. It's taken a lot of work, but I'm at a much better place now, especially when it comes to just managing relationships, whether they're romantic relationships or personal relationships or professional relationships. I feel like that's where the biggest benefit has come. So that's what I want to help people be able to, to navigate and, and recognize in themselves this awareness of, oh, like I'm, I'm hot and bothered right now. Where is this coming from? And if I'm all hot and bothered, where can I, what, what, what is it, what is it that's causing me to feel that way? And how can I respond to this as opposed to emotionally react? Okay. So what are some of your best tips to help establish like your discipline and consistency? Those kind of things. Yeah, I'm a big believer. There, there's, this is, this is billy science right here there's no there's no science involved in this this is just kind of my approach to things i think the first 90 minutes of your day and the last 90 minutes of your day are the most important 180 minutes why did i choose 180 because if you want to turn your life around you need to make a 180 that's it it's as corny as you want it to be <laughs> but that's kind of how i i see it so having that morning routine is really crucial just kind of doing the same thing over and over and over again in your morning routine. Yes, you're going to have flexibility, you're going to have some autonomy in that morning routine, but trying to keep it the most consistent as you possibly can each and every single day. And I think that also communicates to yourself that hey, these are my boundaries right here. These are this is time for me to mentally prepare myself for the day. Now, the area where I need a lot of work is the evening 90 minutes, is those last 90 minutes of the day. So I I could do better about getting into a, a routine for that and then just sort of looking at what that looks like and letting that letting that my day just sort of simmer, right? Just sort of just sort of cool down. So those are those those are areas that I know that I could improve. But the first 90 minutes of my day, I, I have a pretty structured routine. I know what, what's going to happen. I know what I'm going to wear when I wake up because I, I've already established that the night before. I was like, all right, this is what I'm going to wear. I don't have to have that thought in my brain when I wake up because there's already a lot of thoughts in my head about what it is that I need to do and what sort of things need to get taken care of. And in, in part of that then, I've created this system called chips. So I'm not a fan of to-do lists because I think to-do lists just keep you busy. So when I wake up in the morning and I kind of do my routine, part of that 90 minute routine is sitting down and creating my chips list. So C stands for complete. These are the things that absolutely positively need to be completed today. So maybe there's about three to five things that need to get done 
today. Not putting them off until tomorrow. These are getting done today. And then the H stands for hooray, because I think you should celebrate when you get those things done. And how you celebrate can look differently. Like maybe it's just, I'm going to watch a couple episodes of this show, or, you know, I I'm going to chat with my friend, or I'm going to go for uh, a walk with my friend, something that's maybe socializing. The, the, the caveat to that is I don't think working out should be included in, in your hooray. I think that should be just something that we do. That's part of our, our daily routine, whether you do it in the morning, the afternoon or the evening, I really don't care. But I think I, I, I don't think a hooray is working out. I also don't, I also advise against saying, Hey, as a hooray, I'm going to treat myself to this dessert or this bottle of wine right here, this glass of wine, because I think what that does is it, it gives us a, a tricky relationship with food and alcohol. So I advise against those kinds of things, but otherwise, you know, do your thing with whatever your, your hooray is. And then IPS stands for in progress or start. These are things that if you have the energy, if you have the time, you can go ahead and move the progress bar along on those tasks that that's what you want. Knowing full well that if you're going to start something, eventually it's going to make its way to the complete category. So in doing that, again, that kind of it, it creates some efficiency throughout my day so that I can I, I know that I'm accomplishing certain things that some people might be that you sound like your day is really, really regimented. Yeah, to a degree, but I still have a lot of flexibility and I still have a lot of autonomy in what I'm doing throughout my day. OK, you mentioned that <clears throat> you used to be a people pleaser. Are you still a people pleaser? And how does it your day? <laughs> yeah, working on it. Oh, constantly working on it. I feel like I'm less of a people pleaser than I used to be. But yeah, <laughs> so here's, I think here was kind of my, the grand awakening. So I was in Seoul last spring and, and I was, I guess I was trying to date a woman and we had gone on a couple dates and they had gone really well, but you know, because I was like, excited and I was like, oh my gosh, like I've been traveling around. This is really nice to have a connection with somebody that it just became, I just became needy. Right. And like, what's, what's the most unattractive thing to a woman is some needy guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so there I was, I was being needy. And part of that is just insecurity too. And so she said to me, Talking to you stresses me out. Mm. And I was like, oh, that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. So I, I realized that, okay, I need to get that under control. And what I was doing and the reason why I was stressing out and the reason why I was getting was so needy is because I realized that she just wasn't as, as into me as I was into her. Mm. And I wasn't willing to accept that. Mm. So once I realized that, okay, you need to stop putting so much time and energy into people who do not reciprocate that same time and energy. Because in doing so, you are sacrificing so much happiness and so much of yourself that is driving you crazy and it's making you needy and it's making you insecure mm. and if they want to be with you they will be with you mm -hmm. and so quit trying to go above and beyond in order to in order to win someone over who just isn't that into you so that was a big realization for me and mm -hmm. so now i've been able to say if you want to hang out you'll hang out and if you don't, you don't. And I'm okay with that. And there's still kind of that old me pops up like, whoa, what's wrong with me? How come you don't want to hang out? So then that's where just that mindfulness practice comes into place. And it's like, hey, that, that guy is coming back. So where is this coming from? 
the number of conversations I have with myself is startling. <laughs> <laughs> but it, because I'm such an overthinker, I mm-hmm. have to have those conversations in order to slow down whatever reactive impulse I, I'm going to have in that situation. Mm-hmm. So, so it's it's helped me be less of a people pleaser. My, mm. I'm still I'm still figuring it out. I'm still working through it, but I'm less of one now. And I think a lot of that again comes from, you know, your your confidence within yourself and and how you how you feel about yourself. And I think a big thing that I've been working on is just kind of like, hey, dude, like there's a lot of good about you. Right. So let's let's go back to to that. You have a lot of positive qualities. You have a lot of positive traits. So and, you know, you have these traits that we could we could lessen. But those are all kind of part of who you are, too. And if you're aware of those, then you can catch yourself when you're going down that rabbit hole. So that has been a you know big, a huge learning for me in the last year and a half is just working through that. Okay. I I read that understanding that you said that understanding your love language and your attachment style somewhat helped you to uh, stop running behind people that don't really want to be bothered with you. So how, how did that, you know, kind of lead to you understanding? Yeah. I realized that I have an anxious attachment style. I don't think anyone listening here is surprised by that. <laughs> 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 um, but, but the, 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 really where this came to, came to light was that the relationship that I was talking about before, and mm-hmm. she has, a uh, 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 what's the one I, now I've just blanked out of my mind. Um, one where you like, where you, 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 you run away from, from some, th- something I can't remember. I, I can't remember what it was. I just lost my train of thought, but anyway, mm-hmm. that was her attachment style. So the more I kind of showered her with affection, the more she pulled away. Um, something avoidance. That's what it is. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I had a brain fart there. <laughs> so yes, yes. She had an avoidant attachment style. And and it, that's not me self or diagnosing her. Mm-hmm. She told me that. Yeah. She said, yeah, my attachment style is avoidant. So when people get too close, then I have a tendency to and avoidant and anxious attachment styles are that's just a, a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah. So I recognize that, you know, and that was that was a good learning for me because I'm like, how many, how many times have I been in that situation? So mm-hmm. that was a huge eye opener. But then I for five and a half years, I dated somebody in, who's still my best friend. We are still best friends. But in terms of love languages, mm-hmm there were there were pieces that were missing and Ooh. and when i actually kind of sat down i remember the first time i heard love languages i'm like this is some woo woo <laughs> bs like and this is why would i pay attention to this right. so then i and then i when i did actually pay attention to it i'm like oh hmm i mean this this makes a little bit of sense and then when i actually started applying it to the relationship that i was in i'm like oh Hmm. This is why I'm, I'm feeling this way. Mm-hmm. And are these things that are missing from this relationship? How much longer am I willing to go without these needs being met? And we had a really good conversation about it. And it was, it was, you know, the most grown up amicable split that a, that a couple could have. Cause she just said, these are things that you, that you need in a relationship, then you should be with someone who can give you those things. And it wasn't fighting, screaming, yelling. It was that tone. I mm. said, yeah, I, th- I think I, I think that's what I need. And she said, well, I don't want to hold you back from that. And so we just went our separate ways, but we are, we are platonic friends forever. Like that's just, and we were, I think that's what had become of the relationship is that it had then become a companionship. And we had just, been platonic we had just been friends for the last half of that relationship so we recognize that oh we're really good friends we just we like we can't fulfill each other's love languages Mm. and 
and I'm I'm grateful for that recognition, and I'm grateful that that this awareness, I'm able to communicate that now moving forward in in other relationships. Do you think that it's super important to know your love language and your attachment style? I think it's beneficial. Certainly. I do think it's beneficial. Um, you know, whether, you know, a lot of these things, a lot of these theories it just kind of comes down to how much weight and how much value do you put into what's being said in there? I mean, do I think attachment styles and love languages are the end all be all of a good relationship? No, I don't. Do I think that they can benefit your understanding of what it is that you need in a relationship and what are some things that may cause you to react a certain way emotionally in a relationship. I do. I think all that kind of stuff is, is really beneficial at the same time. I want to advise people not to consume too much self help out there. Because then what happens is you're just constantly diagnosing yourself. Mm. You're constantly diagnosing yourself. So find some things that work for you and, you know, apply those. And then when you get to a point where you're like, all right, I feel really good about myself. What's where else? What other areas can I improve? Then you can look for other self or, you know, self-help or professional help, career help, relationship help that you can apply and it just kind of scaffold and grow. But if you try to do it all at once, <laughs> ugh, all you're doing is just self-diagnosing and then that becomes your whole life and you're just consuming it and you're not ever applying it to your growth. I agree. <laughs> can you tell me, you talk about mindfulness a lot and you talk about mindful relationships. What exactly is that? Yeah, so really mindfulness comes down to your awareness mm -hmm. of what is present in the moment. Mm -hmm. So what thoughts, feelings, and emotions are present in the moment? How did, what's there? Mm -hmm. And I think especially when you're having a conversation with somebody, mm -hmm. you can be present with what is and actually listen to what they are saying especially if it's a conversation like hey we need to sit down and talk right mm -hmm. nobody wants to hear that so then what happens what well we get all of a sudden we feel like uh oh i'm stressed out i'm anxious what's going to what are we going to talk about all of those emotions come up mm -hmm. but if you're aware that all right i'm already on edge mm -hmm. so let me breathe into this a little bit. Where am I feeling this tension? Can I bring some softness to this? And we call that somatic experience. And that mm -hmm. actually is what has helped me the most in recognizing when I'm experiencing anxiety is where I, I, I always know when I'm feeling anxious because I feel it in my stomach. Mm -hmm. And if I, if what I don't want to do is I don't want to try and push that anxiety down in, from my stomach because it's just going to push back and then I can feel it in my chest and my breathing starts to shorten and then my shoulders start to hike up. Those are all somatic cues that mm -hmm. the body is giving the brain that you are in danger. Mm -hmm. And when you are in danger, then that amygdala, the animal brain activates and then you go into fight, flight or fright mode. And what we want to do is bring awareness to, all right, I'm feeling I'm feeling this tension. I'm feeling the stress in here. Let me see if I can bring some softness and release some of that tension into it so that I can be present with what's going on in this conversation and not take it personally, hear the person's feedback. But then it doesn't mean that you are passive and saying, oh, I agree with everything you're saying. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is, I see where you're coming from. Let me share with you what what my perspective is. This is where I'm coming from. <laughs> and in doing so, then you're able to have this mutually respectful conversation where both of you are able to share. This is what I'm observing. 
Can you tell me a little bit more about that? And this is how it's impacting me. Like, okay. And it, it, you're that way you're avoiding gaslighting mm. because you're able to say, all right, I hear what you're saying. I can be more aware of, of when those things are happening. Let me explain to you where I'm coming from when I say those things and, and why I'm saying those things. And it's just having that, that mutually respectful conversation because it's coming from compassion and it's coming from awareness of what is present both physically and emotionally. Okay. So for mindfulness and how you got to that point of being so mindful, did you do therapy or, or journaling? Yeah. Oh, I'm a huge advocate of therapy. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of therapy. And I, you know, 10 years ago, I was struggling with anxiety and depression, and that was starting to manifest into suicidal ideation. And my best friend has his PhD in, in forensic neuropsychology. So it's a good friend to have. But the other thing is that like you can't dump all of your problems on your friends because a lot of times your friends are just going to tell you what you want to hear. And that's, that's great and all, but you do need someone to help you kind of process through what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so he said, listen, based on these things that you're telling me, you need to go work with a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right. So then I went and started working with a therapist. Her name is Mindy Ben Dixon. And I always mention her name because without her, I don't I don't know if I would be here because I was really, really struggling. And she introduced me to this mindfulness practice. Okay. And in doing so, it's just kind of revolutionized my life. And I continue to, to meditate. If, if I'm, I try to meditate daily. Some days I, I'll miss. But for the most part, you know, I would say that I get in a, a, 10, or 15 med a 10 or 15 minute meditation at least four or five times a week. Ooh. And in doing so, it just allows me to slow down those thoughts it allows me to be present but then i call these that's that's practice but then there are these game time moments there are these in the moment where you're like feeling all this the this energy come up or feeling all the stress come up and you can't just say hey time out i'm gonna go meditate on this for 10 15 minutes all right you can't do that but because I've established this meditation practice, I'm able to recognize that, oh, hey, this is a feeling that I remember, and this, or this is a thought that I've had before. Mm -hmm. So that I'm able to catch that as I'm feeling it in my body and be like, oh, this is back again. So now that you're aware of it, let's just kind of breathe that softness into it. Let's, let's be mindful of where you're feeling that body and what's actually coming up. So mm -hmm. that we're able to respond as opposed to react. So when you're doing your meditation, do you do guided meditation or? Yeah, I prefer to do guided meditations. I'm a, I'm, I just like having that. Um, you know, I've done silent meditations before for 10, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. but I, I really do prefer having the guided meditations. So, and <clears throat> some people, some people like, don't like guided meditations mm -hmm. i do i'm 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 i much more prefer those and that's when i'm leading meditations that's what i'm doing i'm leading guided meditations they're about 10 to 15 minutes and then we have a discussion about hey what came up for you during that time what was challenging for you mm -hmm. during that time we process through it because when you first start out practicing mindfulness a lot of things that you didn't maybe recognize were there Mm -hmm. come up they start to bubble to the surface and then they're, you, that's present awareness but then oh my gosh how do i handle all of this new information i think that's sort of the dark side of self-help that people don't talk about is that like yeah you start to figure some things out but then there's also a lot of regret or there's a lot of grief that comes with that mm -hmm. how do you process through that regret and regrief or that regret and that grief because 
you know, you're, you're, you're looking back on, oh my gosh, did I, I wasted so many opportunities. I, I made so many mistakes in my life. Mm. Well, and we need to build that self-compassion into it. Right. Okay. So as we come to a close of today's podcast, I would like to ask if you could go back and talk to 17 year old Billy and talk to him about life and some things that he's about to experience, what would you tell him? It's funny. I, I always think about this question and I'm like, would 17 year old Billy even listen? <laughs> My old ass, would he, they like, would he, would he have, would he listen at all to anything that I have to say? Mm -hmm. So let's, so I think about, okay, what are some things that maybe he would listen to? So I think I would, I would tell him, listen, uh, when it when it when it comes to relationships just chill out a little bit <laughs> just re, just relax uh just kind of and, and i think i think just having one conversation with me wouldn't be enough i need to have multiple conversations with that with that younger version of myself so i think there's that piece of it mm -hmm. but then also i think too like uh i i'm a certified personal trainer now but i'm I've always been like when I was in high school, I was 132 pounds soaking wet, you know, mm. five, eight, five, nine, what have you. And I was terrified of going into a weight room. Mm. And it wasn't until I got to college and I, well, I think I was a junior in college. I was 21. And my friend Buck said, you're coming to the weight room with me and you're going to see that it's not that scary. And I'm like, no, no, I'm weak. I'm weak. He's like, no one is going to care. Everyone else is working out and doing their thing. No one is going to care. So this is, you know, this is before social media when people are recording and and, and trying <laughs> to make fools of other people. But mm -hmm. I would tell I would tell him that that hey, just go in, do your thing. You're not going to be able to rely on just natural gifted uh, ability for long because at some point in time. People are just going to be able to catch up with you. Mm -hmm. And that's not just true in athletics. That's true in all areas that you're going to have to put in the work. So, you know, I think I would have that conversation with them, too. And I also tell them, hey, this is not your thing, but yoga would really benefit you. And I, I tell I would tell any if you're a 16 year old boy out there right now, start doing yoga. Because it's so beneficial in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And now I am old and I am rickety and I am stiff. And I wish that I would have gotten into yoga because mm -hmm. as I'm still trying to do my bro lifts, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, I don't have that same range of motion and yoga or at least some mobility work would significantly help you out with all of that. So all you young guys who think you're too cool for yoga and yoga isn't enough of a lift, bro, shut up and get into yoga on the mat. Just, just mm -hmm. get down there, get in and it will benefit you in so many ways, physically and mentally. Definitely. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Billy, for joining us. Our time went by so fast. Can you tell everyone how they can follow you and keep up with you? Yeah, the easiest way to follow me is on Instagram. My Instagram is mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. Follow and subscribe the Mindful Midlife Crisis podcast. We've got a lot of great topics over there, a lot of great conversations that we've had. If you're like, where do I start for that? You can go to www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com. Join the newsletter there. If you want to see what episodes are, are fan faves, you can click on podcast and there's a fan faves section there. We have over 100 episodes, so if people want to kind of narrow that down, you can go to that fan faves. I'm also fairly prolific on LinkedIn. I like talking to people on LinkedIn as well, so you can find me at Billy Lahr. It's L-A-H-R. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Billy, again, for joining us. Thank you for giving us some information on mindfulness, and I'm sure the listeners took some great notes because I did as well. Um, great. If you're interested in learning more about mindfulness, I do a weekly meditate and mingle session 
every 8 p.m. on Mondays Central Time. So feel free to to join that. I would love to to love see, see people there. Hey, you just kind of dabble in it. It's donation based, but okay. just it, it, donations are always appreciated, but they're not expected. Okay. So if you're like, I'm curious what this is, what this whole mindfulness is all about. I actually have meditate and mingle episodes on the podcast. You can check those out. And if you're like, oh, I feel like this might be beneficial, then come and check things out. Okay. All right. That sounds good. All right. So, um, well, you're in South Korea, so you don't, you don't have Thanksgiving. <laughs> so actually I, I'm part of a meetup group and <laughs> I'm one of the organizers for that. And I, I've organized Friendsgiving. Okay. So we, so we're doing Friendsgiving and it's, it's funny because when I've organized, this is the second year I've organized it. And last year they're like, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving here. And I'm like, <laughs> I know you don't, but like I do. And when you can't be around your family, then right. we do this thing called Friendsgiving and you're all my friends. And they're yeah, like, because- okay, what's that all about? And I'm like, we just eat. Let's just, we're just going <laughs> right. to go we're just going to get a big group of us and we're going to go out to eat. So on Saturday, we have a group of 40 of us and we're getting together wow. and we're going out for some Korean. They're like, but wait, we're not eating turkey and mashed potatoes. <laughs> no, we're going to eat Korean food as a group. So it's just going to be fun. And uh-huh. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a, it's a great group of people. And when I say that that meetup group has changed the course of my life, I, I mean that literally because I wouldn't be here surrounded by my crew people that that fill me with joy to fill me with happiness had i not met that group so i am eternally grateful for the opportunity to be surrounded by such an amazing community okay that's awesome thank you for sharing that um so to you all that's been listening thank you so much for sticking around thank you for being here as always and i will see you all if the lord says the same on what Tuesday, Thursday. I forgot what today is, but I will see you then. Thank you so much. You all have a great day. Bye-bye and happy Friendsgiving and Thanksgiving.